Musa alayhi salam, alhamdulillah, he's back with his mom. He's at the house, she's breastfeeding him, she's taking care of him. Asiya radiallahu anha is paying her very, very well. Musa alayhi salam becomes known as the adopted son of Pharaoh and Asiya. Unbelievable. So much so that he now he is known as Prince Musa, Al-Amir Musa. And after approximately two years, when the breastfeeding phase has come to an end, Musa goes back to the palace of Fir'aun. Of course, the breastfeeding lady, which is his actual real mother, she still has access to see him every now and then. She would communicate with Asiya radiallahu anha. You know, I have this connection with him. And Allah knows best exactly how things unfolded. But we know the main thing, the rahmah of Asiya radiallahu anha and her understanding. But there's no communication from my understanding. And in the books that they spoke to another, Asiya, by the way, I'm his mother. And there's nothing I'm able to confirm with that. When Musa alayhi salam moved back to the house, to the palace, he was being raised by Asiya, not Fir'aun. Though he was a baby, Fir'aun could not stand him, guys. That's how evil he was. He doesn't spend time with him. He doesn't play with him. There's one narration in the books of Tafsir that says, one time, he said, look, let me see. It's like, yeah, Fir'aun, you got to see this baby boy. There's one narration. And he grabbed baby Musa, and baby Musa held his beard so strong, and he hurt, hurt him so bad. So he said, kill him, muqtulu. Like that's how crazy this guy is, all right? So he doesn't play around with him whatsoever. Eventually, some books of history said that they eventually got children. Fir'aun and Asya eventually other, got other kids. But now Musa alayhi is growing and more and more. He notices my dad, quote unquote Fir'aun, is not nice with me the way he is with other kids. But it doesn't matter. For Musa gets the best education. Musa gets the best physical training. Musa becomes very healthy and very fit. He goes through his teenage years. He grows older and older. And somehow, somewhere, sometime, the news is broken down to him. Especially after he realizes this quote unquote father, Pharaoh, he keeps telling people he's God. It doesn't make sense. I see him getting sick. I see him getting hungry. I see him going to the bathroom. I see him sleeping. And a God does not need the bathroom, nor does he need to sleep. So if a God sleeps, who takes care of the world? He's learning. He sees that Pharaoh is, is using magicians to trick the citizens of the country. And remember, every Pharaoh till this day will always have a group of magicians in one way or another. They had sticks that they would throw along with ropes scaring the people whenever they want to, let's say, irritate Fir'aun and not listen to him or so, see the snakes will eat you. And they were fake snakes and يُخَيَّلُ إِلَيْهِمْ It just seems like they are. He uses magic. And he uses a snake as a symbol to protect him. If you see even in, whether cartoon or in real life, in Egyptology, many of the Pharaoh's you know, drawings, they had snakes. Because they used to believe snakes protect us. SubhanAllah. If you even saw in the image here, that's to show you that how famous the whole snake thing is. Even in a cartoon image, there's a snake on the top of his crown. It's like the god, one of their gods that they have to show so much respect to. He grows and grows and grows until he is told, listen, Musa, yes, I'm not your mom. I'm not your real mom. Musa, your real mom is so and so. How does it break down? Allah does not mention in the Quran, but what we know for a fact that he eventually learned it. And Allah re reveals what we need to know. And this is your sister, Maryam. And this is your brother, Harun. And Musa, you're actually not Egyptian, basically, after telling you this. You're actually from Bani Israel. You're not from the Aqbat. You're not from the Misreen. Yeah, Allah bless him. Okay, so then he's realizing all of this, and definitely it's a shock to him. Eventually, Musa, he wants to go to Bani Israel. I want to see my mom. I want to get to know and have these conversations with her. He goes to his mom, spends some time, and now people are noticing Musa is continuously leaving the palace to the village of Bani Israel. Remember I told you, rich family, poor family, experiencing both. So he's a type of guy that may park his Ferrari or, or so, and then he sits in a very, very, very poor village, eats on the floor with the family and so on. He went through both types of experiences. And now he learns what? The deen. 
He taught you are from Bani Israel. Do you know what does that mean? You come from Prophet Ya'qub alayhi salam. Prophet Ya'qub, teach me. He was taught La ilaha illallah. Makes sense. He was told Yusuf was the Rasul Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's told about the scriptures of the time and everything. And he wants to lift the oppression. He wants to work as hard as he can. Allah says, Allah says when he became strong mentally and physically, we gave him wisdom and knowledge and that's how we reward the good doers. He was in the service of the people. He was very physically strong. He used his strength to help the people until one day. One day, Musa السلام, he enters the city at a time where people are not really walking around the roads and streets, it was quiet. Maybe it's Qailula, nap time, around the Dhuhr Asr time, or maybe it was dark late at night. When he arrived at that time, what happened? فَوَجَدَ فِيهَا رَجُلَيْنِ يَقْتَتِلَانِ He found two people fighting one another. So bad. Who are these people? هَذَا مِنْ شِيْعَتِهِ وَهَذَا مِنْ عَدُوِهِ one of them was from Bani Israel. The other one was from the Musriyin, the Aqbat. And they were going, going hard on one another. And the guy is being caused, like, let go. And he wants to punch the other one. Who's seeing this? Musa. The one from Bani Israel said, Musa, get rid of this guy. He's about to kill me. Now Musa knows Bani Israel are oppressed. And this guy is mazloom, the way he's being treated. As, a, as not even a human being, as animals, overworking them and so on, and now darb and hitting and beating. So Musa alayhi salam gets so angry. He goes to this guy and he goes to the guy from Bani Israel. He wants to separate. He's like, Wakhar wasa, move. And he hit him so hard. He hit him so hard that he killed him. Faqada Ali. What happened? Musa could not believe what just happened. He saw that this is murder. This is a crime. La, 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 la. He could not believe it. Right away, what are you saying? هَذَا مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ Oh my God, he's dead. Is he dead? He's dead. هَذَا مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ This is from the shaytan. إِنَّهُ عَدُوٌ مُضِلٌ مُبِينٌ He is an enemy. Takes us astray. Clearly, he has no mercy towards us. What does the devil have to do with this? What does the devil have to do with anger and ghadab? Musa was so angry, he's like, move! And for Waqazahu, with this, he killed him. He didn't mean to, it was accidental. Rasulullah shows you there's a clear correlation between when we get angry and shaitan. In certain instances, in one hadith, authentic Rasulullah he saw two men fighting. One of the two, his jugular vein was about to pop out of anger, which is extreme anger. He was like, oh, I, want to, I want to do this. Like, even the face, like, scary. That's how angry he was. And I mention this detail specifically to show you the extreme level of what? Anger. Rasulullah he sees this and look to what he says. Ready? For all the people that get angry, especially for reasons you shouldn't be. He says, Inni la kalima. I know a statement. One statement. One thing. If he says, all that anger will be gone. Rah, kullu rah. Mission will be reduced by 50, no, gone. But you have to say it with Iman. You have to say it with belief. What's that statement? A'udhu Billahi min ash Now you see the correlation. A'udhu Billahi min ash And why do I say, say it with belief? Because if you tell some people, you have to assess the situation. Not everybody can be reminded, so you have to know who you're talking to. So some people tell him, say, A'udhu Billah and Shaitan. He's like, what? Shaitan has nothing to do with it. It's the other guy who's a Shaitan who's making me angry. Tell him to say, A'udhu Billah from himself. Right? And then, khalas, okay. قُلْ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَلَّمْ Say dhikr Allah. And then he says things of kufr. May Allah protect us. So be aware. So here it shows you. So Musa A.S. realizes, هَذَا مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ then right after that, what happens, brothers and sisters? Musa alayhi salam seeks forgiveness from Allah. He says, Rabbi inni dhalamtu nafsi. Ya Allah, I messed up. I made a disaster. I wronged myself. This is dhulum. This is an, a, a moment of oppression. Faghfir li. Ya Allah, forgive me. Here he shows you something. When you admit the mistake, it's not enough. 
Yeah, it was me who did this. Oh my God, I can't, yeah, yeah, I messed up. That's, that's good. No, incomplete, but it's good. He followed it up with, li. Ya Allah, I'm sorry. I admit and I apologize. That's a whole different stage. li. Ya Allah, forgive me. And right after that, فَغَفَرَ lah. Right after, Allah says, and I forgave him for it. So seek Allah's forgiveness. Apologize to Allah. Admit your mistakes and shortcomings and seek his forgiveness. Allah is, as he says, Al Ghafur Rahim. Allah is and will always be the most forgiving, the most merciful. Always. And the door of repentance, as Muhammad sallallahu, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, the door of repentance will always be open until when? Until the sun rises from the west, which is a sign of the day of judgment. So the door is open. It's up to you to make the decision. Allah's door policy is open for repentance. May Allah forgive us all. May Allah allow us to repent back to him. Is that enough? No, one more thing. One more thing. He makes a promise. Qala Rabbi, bima an'amta alayya falan akuna zahiran al-mujrimin. Ya Allah, I will never ever in my life use the blessing you gave me to aid, to support the oppressors of Zalimin. What happens? Sometimes, let's say for example, I give a lecture, a session, I mess up, I get embarrassed, I'm like, I'm, you know what, I quit. Happens or not, you become part of a board in the masjid, or something, help in accounting, or this, or secretary, or whatever. Oh, masjid full of kada, I'm never praying in the masjid. Happens? It happens. How many times people go to an MSA, or to a Muslim gathering, or something like that, something wrong, wrong happens, yeah, I'm not ever going to do this again. La. You know what he made a promise? I will always and forever support the oppressed. He just said, I got in trouble for this. I'm not doing this again. No, I'm going to always do this. But I'm going to do it right next time. Ya Allah, al hikmah, wisdom. I'm going to do it right next time. I'm going to be with the right group of people. I'm going to go to the right masjid, inshallah. I'm going to do the right stuff. I'm not going to quit. Because if you want to judge Islam based on Muslims, then you can really have a bad grade. Correct? But you judge Islam based on the Quran and the Sunnah. May Allah make us upon them say Ameen. Ameen Rabbil Ameen. And look what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says. He says, وَمَنْ مَشَى مَعَ مَظْلُومٍ حَتَّى يُثْبِتَ لَهُ حَقَّهُ Whoever aids the oppressed, the mazloom, the mazloom, whoever aids and supports them and tries everything possible to bring them back their rights. ثَبَّتَ اللَّهُ قَدَمَيْهِ عَلَى الصِّرَاطِ يَوْمَ تَزُولُ الْأَقْدَامِ Allah will make your legs steadfast on the bridge which is over hell on the day where people slip and fall into hell. You want Allah to protect you on that day, on that night, on that location? Support the oppressed in the dunya. And he made this promise to Allah, but he knows I have to leave the scene. La, where's the akhlaq? Where's the real Muslim? You should go to the hakim and say, Ana akhtat, I'm sorry, I killed him. Go to Fir'aun. Uh, go to who? Who's going to be the just judge? He had to relieve the scene. Musa runs away. The guy from Bani Israel, he also runs away. They both remain silent. No one says anything. And the news goes like wildfire. A Masri Qutil! A Wahad Mil Akbat, one of the Coptic people has been killed. This is unacceptable. Justice has to be applied. The Egyptians and the other people country, they come hand in hand. Huh? Together for these people that died. We have to, but what about the thousands of babies you just killed? Subhanallah. Munafiqeen wa kada wa kada wa kada, may Allah protect us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. So then this happens. So then Pharaoh gets angry. I want this person. I want him dead or alive. They don't know who is it. No one knows who is it. Who is it? They ask, there's no evidence, no proof. Allah says about Musa, as strong as he is, you know what Allah said? Allah says, فَأَصْبَحَ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ خَائِفًا يَتَرَقَّبْ Musa khalas, that sakina of, like, of aman and safety is gone. He's walking so scared and vigilant. What will happen? And he's nervous. Will someone come accuse me of this? Did someone see me? Is this other guy going to tell the world about this? He's so scared, he's so nervous. The next day, he's walking in the street. فَإِذَا الَّذِي اسْتَنْصَرَهُ بِالْأَمْسِ the guy yesterday, the Bani Israel guy who was fighting, now he's in another fight the next day. And he hits the other guy, the Egyptian, the guy punches him back. The Bani Israel is oppressed. But he's pushing back. Who does the Bani Israel guy see? 
Musa, Ya Musa, help again. Musa is like, إِنَّكَ لَغَوِيٌّ مُبِينٌ He understands what it means. The guy from Egypt doesn't know what he really means. Musa is telling this Bani Israel guy, which is part of his general family, you're a troublemaker. Like, bro, you know what happened yesterday? Couldn't you just relax a couple days? Like, let the news quiet down? You went like, oh, no, fight back. Never take a fight that you know for a fact you will always lose at. And he goes, like, yeah, Musa. So you want me to do what I did yesterday? And shuf, some people, subhanAllah, they abuse your kindness, Marat. And they know when they ask you for help, you will get in trouble. And you will be in hardship. But who cares since it's offered for free? Why not? May Allah protect us from being such people and from having such people. So Musa says, You're a troublemaker, man. Then, Remember what Allah promised he made yesterday? I will always support the oppressed. He came. To separate, but now he's going to control himself. <laughs> Not strong. I'm too, alhamdulillah, too strong. I'm going to use it properly. Right? I'm going to use to separate. He used to judge what happened, what's going on. He will do his best. As he was coming, شوف, pay attention. The guy from Bani Israel, which is his extended family, thought Musa is going to punch him. You see? Why? Because he just told him, إِنَّكَ لَغَوِيُّ and are troublemakers. He's coming. So this guy's like, oh, what, you want to kill me like the way you killed the guy yesterday? The Egyptian was like, what? It's Musa? <laughs> Book it to Pharaoh. We have a witness from his own family saying, al al qatil the killer. Then he told Musa, Remember yesterday you tried to kill me now again? No, Pharaoh was, Musa was trying to separate. He said, Oh, what you want to do, this Prince Musa, is to be a tyrant on earth. You don't want to fix things right. You're a show off, you're arrogant. You do the khair, you do the good, and people accuse your intention, and so on and so forth. Musa is now terrified. And the guy, he left the scene, forget the fight, I'm going to Pharaoh. He goes to Pharaoh, goes to the security, whatever is necessary, listen to what happened, I know who killed him. Who did? Musa. Musa, a meeting, right away happens. What's the matter? Musa did it. So this is the plan. The plan is to kill him. Investi investigation? Uh, did, you, did you just say investigation? No, I said kill him, let's go kill him. Let's go kill him. I'm not, I didn't propose anything. No proposals, whatever Pharaoh says happens. So one of the people, who is it? Allah knows best. But you know what Allah said? Rajul. Zalama. Man. He says, وَجَاءَ رَجُلٌ مِنْ أَقْصَى الْمَدِينَةِ يَسْعَى A man who heard the news that the plan is to kill Musa. No investigation. Nothing like that. He heard it, so he ran as fast as he can. Yes'a. Run. He goes to Musa. Ya Musa. What's going on? Ya Musa. إِنَّ الْمَلَأَ يَأْتَمِرُونَ بِكَ لِيَقْتُلُوكَ فَخْرُجْ إِنِّي لَكَ نَاصِحِينَ they're planning to kill you. Run for your life. I promise I'm telling you what's best for you. There's no way out of this. Just run for your life. Musa alayhi salam, is he going to say bye to Asiya after all these years? Is he going to go tell his mom, his sister, his brother Harun? No. And he runs for his life. He's scared. He's terrified. He goes running. Vigilant, aware of what's happening until Allah says in the Quran that He made dua, Rabbi Najini min al qawmi al Ya Allah, do al Ya Allah. These people are oppressors, Ya Allah. They give no chance to tell my side of the story. Yes, I made a mistake. Yes, I deserve to pay a fee. There's a blood money. Even in Islam, when you kill someone by mistake, there's different rulings than doing it intentional. But Pharaoh was waiting for something to happen to get rid of Musa. He never knew he's a prophet, but he felt this guy is having a lot of, winning a lot of people's hearts. Asya loves him. Soldiers are very, you know, impressed by him. And he wants to get rid of him. And now he left. Great. Pharaoh is probably happy. Because he was able to get rid of Musa without the need of what? Killing him. Because if he killed him, it might cause an uprising in Bani Israel. Until this day, this happens sometimes. People are oppressed, are quiet, are weak. But there's a certain individual, if you kill in that oppressed, weak group, 
there's an uprising, correct? If you see what happens in the Middle East and so on, sometimes it's one person, like in one country, the guy who burnt himself. May Allah have rahman all of us, Ya Rab. One miskin guy, not known, but he did this, khalas, the whole country. And there's coup that took place and the president left. Sometimes, so Fir'aun knows, as strong as I may be, Bani Israel is big in numbers. I don't want to kill Musa just like that. But this was a great opportunity to kill him. But you know what? It's good that he left anyways. So Musa alayhi salam runs as far as he can. No luggage, no food, no drink, no extra clothing and shoes. Maybe just some pocket money, that's all what he has. The one who was living in the palace of Fir'aun now is pretty much homeless, hungry, almost losing all his slippers because of the blood as he traveled for such long time. Where is he going? He wants to leave the entire country of Egypt because he doesn't want to go to another part of Egypt where there's communication. Like he went to this city within that jurisdiction. So he went to where, as Allah says in the Quran, Median. Median is a city outside the control of Fir'aun. And some say today, where is Median? Anybody knows? Some say, uh, some people say it's in Urdun, Allah Ta'ala Alam, in Jordan. So the point being, Allah says, When he was headed towards Median, he was asking Allah, Ya Allah, guide me to the right path. Guide me, Ya Allah, I don't know where I'm going. Like I'm completely lost. It's like you're in driving and there's no GPS, the battery died. Khalas, I don't know what I'm doing, anything like that in the desert. Did you notice something happening? Every time Musa Isam wants something to take place, he takes action, what's accompanied with that action? Dua. You will always see it with Musa. He made that sin or that crime. Then he made tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He made tawbah, what was action followed with it? The dua, Ya Rabbi, forgive me. What was followed with it? I will always support the oppressed. And he did the next day, sah? What happened? He was scared he will be killed. So he ran for his life, didn't pack any luggage, he took the means. What, what did he say? Oh Allah, protect me from the oppressors. He's traveling and traveling and traveling and asking and doing whatever is necessary to leave the area. And what did he also say? Ya Allah, guide me. When you have decisions in life, always have dua part of your decision process. They tell you, there's a whole seminar about decision making. But as a Muslim, you'll always have a step called dua, also known as istikhara. Just this week, I spoke to a brother, bought a very expensive house, very expensive. He's asking me, what do you think about this, Kada? What, you know, suggestions and so on. Besides the price of the house, I asked him, did you pray istikhara? And especially when people ask you after they signed the contract and everything. Sometimes you're like, and what should I tell you, right? It's like someone who did this, and I, from my personal opinion, I don't think he should have got it at all. But he paid, had deposit. So out of my wisdom, Mabruk, may Allah put barakah in it. Because it's not wise to say, Ghalat's wrong. It's pretty much over here. And to an extent, of course, you can always retreat, but may you lose the deposit. So I said, did you do istikhara? Da'ut Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, no, but you know, tawakkalt Allah. No, you don't do stuff like that. As a Muslim, la. You make decisions in life accompanied by dua. You apply for your MCATs, DATs, whatever test you have to do. Ya, ya Allah, najihni. Ya Allah, grant me success and you study. This is what we learned from Musa alayhi salam. When he arrived to Median, what did he see? Allah says, Ummah, a lot of people around the well trying to water their cattle and animals and them sheep and so on. So there's a well, they get water and they pass it to their animals. They drink, fill up buckets and then they leave. So ummah, crowded. Okay. But then Allah says, Then he saw two ladies on the other side. They're all pretty much men. Two ladies on the side, tadudan, like they're holding back their sheep because like they want to proceed forward. So they're just like holding, holding. So Musa alayhi salam sees this. And he says, what's the matter? And I say the ayah is simple, but Allah says it very profoundly. Musa, inta fadi, inta you, and you have time to ask, like, what's, what's the matter? He's been traveling for hundreds of miles. Hundreds of miles. Minimal break. No one to catch up with him. And now he's concerned about two ladies 
who are struggling with their sheep, you're supposed to be the one that the whole ummah should come to you like, ma khatbak. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Because when they travel at that time, even till this day, but not as much as before, feast something called alamat al safar. There are signs of traveling. There's a very famous hadith about Jibreel alayhi salam when he went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The hadith says, and he came and he has no signs of traveling. So the people were very confused. Like, we don't know you from Medina, but you don't look like you're a traveler. Like, which is so, because the dust, the clothes, the beard, the hair, forget the gel, gel, raham, no, no, it's over, right? All that stuff, everything, you look really miserable. And that's how Musa Asam looked. And I want you to imagine in that image, he's like, Ma khatbukuma? what's the matter? You really want to help them? You really care about them? I ask you by Allah. You have a road trip, okay? Let's say you go from Detroit to New York. 10 hour drive, roughly, roughly, depending how fast you drive. And then 10 hour drive in a car with a GPS, when like every five miles or so, a uh, rest area. Your kid tells you, Bobo, bathroom. Oh, you have no patience to wait in a car to drop him. In the, uh, Bobo, bathroom, bathroom. I, I've been traveling for seven hours. We just stopped, not stopping. Bathroom, do it in your seat. <laughs> right? Yeah, the patience. So, why am I saying this very simple example? Right? By the way, we're laughing, and may Allah make you all happy. But when this happens, you know how tough it is, okay? May Allah make it easy, Allah. Right? So the point being this, Musa Asim, in the midst of his traveling, he's exhausted. What's the matter? So the two ladies, very straightforward, professional, respectful. They said, The only reason we're here is that we're waiting for these men to finish. And once they finish, we come and they, we water our herd or cattle. And if it wasn't for our dad who's old, we would have not been here. And he, my dad is really old. He used to do this, but now he became old. So now we do on his behalf. Otherwise, we would have never been here. Musa alayhi salam is disturbed. Not a single zalama, not a single man sees two ladies. And ummah tamin al nas, they bring in the water and there's two ladies struggling. What, what's the rule here? Power and strength? What's the matter with these people? He's upset. He doesn't talk to the ladies. He grabs the sheep they had. He grabs it. Allah told it's like me, it's like me talking to someone and they have in their bag. Oh, I'm struggling, the bag is heavy. He doesn't say, okay, let me carry it. No, he goes, he grabs the bag. Okay, he takes the sheep, he's exhausted. Come here. Oh, who's this guy all alone by himself? Some said in the narration, Hunaka Sakhra, big rock in the process. He wants to go from a direction. Sakhra, the, about seven to ten people to carry it. Musa came by himself, grabbed it, moved it. Ya akhi safar, fasaqa lahuma. He came with the cattle, brought water to all of them. People were like, man, look at this guy. Brought water to all of them. Then he came, returned it back to the two ladies. Didn't say a single word. And he left. Thumma tawalla ila Then he rested under a shade of a tree or so. And he says, Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqeer. He sat down. He could have asked for help, but he's just resting. He's sitting. He says, Ya Allah, anything that you can give me can be good for me, Ya Allah. Please help me, Ya Allah. Anything you can give me. Could he ask the two ladies for a favor in return? Sah mumkin. But don't do these things sometimes. You took it on a voluntary basis. Don't do the task and ask to get paid for the volunteer work. It happened to one of the elders not saying in Dearborn, a guy did a major volunteer work, major, major. And then he found that the other guy is doing it too, and so on, and, then, and so on, they had so much money. So he demanded payment. And this caused a big problem. May Allah protect us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And they actually cut the ties of the kinship. So beware. So he did this task. May Allah grant you all the ability to volunteer. Say, Ameen. And then Musa, alayhi salam, he made dua to Allah and he vented. He vented. Ya khitab, uh, is venting to Allah helpful? Have you tried venting to Allah? Can you promise to do that inshallah? One time, at least? It's a ibadah that Allah loves. Brother, but I need to vent. You know, people say, I vent. If I don't vent, I'm going to explode. And I'm going to go crazy. I actually 110% agree with you. If you do not talk to someone about your problem, especially the big one, you will lose your mind. Guaranteed. Or you have a PhD in this? I'm telling you, you will go nuts. Trust me. But all what I'm asking you to do, channel your venting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
But what about the people? Then to the one who can help you. Then to the doctor who can help you in your sickness. Then to the person who can change that. If you're feeling hot right now, talk to the owner of the venue. Let's change the temperature. The speaker is so loud. Tell the brother to lower the volume. Then to the one who can change it. If you tell the one next to you, it is so loud in here. Okay. Good. Sah? <laughs> 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 What, what, so, so we like, yeah, right? So all these, even psychologically, when you complain about something, usually it gets worse on you. So if, yes, I don't have no problem. Vent and complain to a person as long as they're able to change that thing. But go to Allah and everything because He can change anything. Because la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There's no change or power except by the will of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And you see, go to Allah when you're maksur. Go to Allah when you're broken. Go to Allah with your weakness. Zakaria alayhi salam, he wanted what? A child. May Allah grant you righteous progeny. Say Ameen. He wanted a child. So he went to Allah with his weakness. What are you saying? Ya Allah, I'm weak. My bones cannot, barely can carry me. And I'm so old. He complained to Allah with his weakness. Prophet Ayyub alayhi salam, what was the thing that he wants? Cure. So he went to Allah with his weakness. Rabbi, masani al-dur. Allah, I'm sick. Help me. And now Musa is going to Allah with his weakness. What does Musa want? I want a house. I want anything. I want food, anything, shelter. That's what he wants. So he goes to Allah with a weakness that matches this. He says, I am what? Faqir, poor. So go to Allah with your weakness, with your broken heart, because only Allah can mend it in a way that no one human being can ever do. So he did that. What happened after that, brothers and sisters? We know to Zakaria, Allah gave him a child, yes or no? What was his name? Yahya. And Allah cured Ayyub, and he gave him his health, and وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعَ And his children. Let's see what happens to Musa alayhi salam. He invents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, help me. Ya Allah, I am weak. Ya Allah, I beg you, please. Ya Allah. What will happen? Will he see something? Is Pharaoh going to capture him? soldiers, all these things. Inshallah, we will know in the last session.